Hey everybody, welcome to the Dad Challenge Podcast. Before we get started today, I wanna to talk to you about Atlas VPN. Atlas VPN was developed by top cybersecurity specialists in 2019, and it currently has over 6 million users worldwide. Atlas VPN is the best deal for VPNs on the market right now as well. It'll stop ads and malware. You get to unlock all your favorite content from all over the world, like watching Netflix from a different country, which I often do. It's not like private browsing. VPN is completely different. The VPN blocks the provider from seeing what you're doing and it keeps you protected and private. You get to protect unlimited devices as well, which is really cool. You get a three year subscription for just $1.83 a month. That's incredible. Plus you get three months free with a 30 day money back guarantee. Time's running out, so get your deal that's linked below. It's usually in the top comment. It's also in the top section of my box down there. I hate when I say something to your wife and then all of a sudden you're getting ads for like underwear on your Facebook. I don't like it. The VPN will protect all of your devices in your home. It'll block the government and all these ISPs from seeing what you're doing. And you need to protect your privacy. You know that. Download from the link below. You get three years for $1.83 a month, three months free, and a 30-day money-back guarantee. You can't beat it, guys. Thanks to Atlas VPN for sponsoring this video. Now let's get to it. Hey everybody, welcome to the Dad Challenge Podcast. Got a special edition of the podcast today for you. I have listened to Jeanette McCurdy's book and I've been really excited about it actually because it really, really does fall in line with what I talk about here with the exploitation of children. Her story is very harrowing. It's very deep and dark and funny and scary and all these kinds of things. I got an interview that she did and I'm going to talk to you about the book itself. I've made my own notes. I know I usually don't do this kind of stuff, right? But it's really, really interesting and it ties really, really well into these parents that use their children to further themselves in every single way. It's a really interesting read. Uh, make sure you go get that book or listen to it if you can. Um, otherwise, let's get to it. Countries, if you want to watch a different Netflix somewhere else, which I do, I enjoy the other countries' Netflix sometimes. You get to unlock all of your favorite content from all over the world. You get to unlock all your favorite content from all over the world, like watching Netflix. From so Jeanette McCurdy, if you didn't know who she was, she's an actress from the show iCarly, which my daughter loves, actually. Loves that show. But I'm really starting to like consider, and it's really hard as a parent, when you know what goes on behind the scenes, like when you finally realize how the sausage is made with child actors, do you still ingest the content? Right, because I've talked about that on this channel lots. Between the the differences between child actors and a child who children who are being exploited on you know social media, that's real and different. Right, so child actors have Coogan laws and they have different protections. They have to be educated, all this kind of stuff. Whereas the kids on the internet who have none of those protections whatsoever. But they're both really bad because I've never actually seen a child star. And maybe there are a few out there who've come out on top who are who are normal. Right. And I made the argument, and I'll make it today again, that these kids don't, none of these kids, from, from the actors to the kids in these family vlogs, do they have ch normal childhoods. They miss out on one of the most imperative things a human could go through, a normal effing childhood. And in a lot of cases, child actors are the ones that are paying their parents' bills. Same with family vloggers who are using their children to pay their bills. Maya Knight intensifies. A lot of these people exclusively have their audience because of their children, and those that in and in turn, those children are paying the bills. Okay, um, so Jeanette McCurdy's book is really, really, really interesting. It takes about six hours to listen to an Audible. I pre, I pre, whatever you call, it, pre bought it way before it came out because I'm like, I'm listening to this. And as I was fixing up my RV, putting the flooring down and all that stuff, it took me about two days. I finished her book, and I can't count the amount of times I was like, what the. F did I just hear? And one of the things I got to talk to you about, Jim, before we get to her book, okay, I'll get to that in a second. I want to get to this interview she did on Nightline and go over a little bit of what she said. And maybe I'll kind of reference the book and come back because I have a terrible memory. And so when I listen to books or when I read books, I can literally read that book like a year later. And it's like, I've never read it. It's good for certain things, but not others, which is why I made notes of her book today. But Jeanette McCurdy, before I get started on all of this stuff, is a brave person for calling out the industry the way she did. It's basically blackballed from the industry for doing what she did, okay? And the people that abused her and took advantage of her, she calls them all out. And it's a really, really good book. I encourage you to go read it, buy it, whatever, okay? Cool. Let's get to this interview. Just do what I need to do and be this, you know, happy-go-lucky Nickelodeon kid. Um, my name is Samantha Puckett, and I'm from Seattle, and I love fried chicken! 
But inside it was hurting, it was painful. I was angry, I felt unsupported. You pull back the curtain on child stardom. It is not a pretty picture. Not as I see it, no. Yeah, she, that's a great question. You pull back the curtain, you see the sausage is made. There's no such thing, like these kids, like even in her story, it's like it's they live adult lives as teenagers. They go partying, they drink, they smoke drugs, they do everything. They do do hard drugs. They they are part of it. The it, because the adults that run the show treat these, they bring the kids into their inner circle, and it's like the, it's like really weird because the creators of these shows are are often friends or want to be friends with these kids, and these kids grow up way faster than everybody else. Again, they are missing that essential element to life, which is a childhood. That is normal. Friends, playing, all the kind of stuff. They miss it because all they're doing is working. And now her story starts out way back in the day when she was six and her mom decided, you're going to be an actor because I wanted to be an actor. Okay, Jeanette McCurdy's mom decided for her that she wanted to do this because she missed out on it and wanted a better life for the family. Hiding it, disguising it as a better life for Jeanette. At just 15, Jeanette McCurdy was one of the most recognizable child stars on television, playing Sam Puckett in Nickelodeon's hit show, I Carly. Where'd my straw go? Here. To her millions of fans, she was known as the funny BFF. But she says behind that bubbly on-screen persona, an adult's game, you're in an adult's world, and you don't recognize that. You're incapable of being on that level, but you are confused and you think that you are. And I think it really leads to um, stunted personal development. Brilliant. I love that she said there, stunted personal development. And that goes across the board for these people like Jess Fam, who has been on YouTube since she's 17. I often say she's developmentally arrested at 17 because she acts that way. She's immature and she she overshares. She's 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 gross. <laughs> she makes bad choices. She just and she 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 glorifies this three baby daddies and all the divorces she's had and all that kind of stuff. It just doesn't make sense as an adult to think that that's a flex, right? So what she just said there is an amazing thing because if you if you reference her book, the one thing that her personal stunt and growth was is because her mom completely and utterly sheltered her from everything. Every moment her mother was with her. If she wasn't on set, her mom was with her. If she wasn't in a, in an audition, her mom was with her reading magazines. Her mom was with her at all times. This girl not only was a, a Mormon, right, that she loved Mormonism, but she also was completely and utterly hidden from the world, which is a, you know, Christian Mormon thing. I've talked about that a lot about the Mormon world and the Christian fundamental world, is that parents will often shelter their kids, especially kids who are homeschooled and stuff like that. Um, they will completely shelter their kids from the world. And it ends up being good and bad, mostly bad because those kids end up tasting the real world when they become independent and they don't know how to handle it. So if you if you teach your kid that the stuff doesn't exist and when those kids get a taste of it, they can't handle it. They don't know what to do. And then they often overdo it, which comes to alcohol, sex, everything else. If you don't teach your kids at least a minimum safe sex and what sex is, those kids are going to end up getting pregnant, right? They're going to end up getting STDs and everything else because they don't know what it is. And they don't know what's what's proper and they don't know when an adult is taking advantage of them. Okay? So the sheltered idea of Christianity and Mormonism is bad, but also good to a degree because the world where we live in right now, oh my gosh, it's like almost worse if you feed them to your to the public school system without educating your kids yourself as well, right? So I kind of see that. Her personal struggles eventually prompting her to abandon acting altogether. You say, quite frankly, that this was never your dream. Stardom was never your dream. Whose dream was it? My mom's. I think she wanted me to have a better life than she had, but I also think her approach was very unhealthy and informed by her own lack of self-work. And she lived vicariously through me. Jeanette had her first audition at age six, encouraged by her late mom. De there she is. Now... I, I'm gonna to go to my notes now because I have to get back to there. So yeah, I think this is the, I think this is gonna work. I'm gonna go through my notes while I do this with you guys. Again, I have to I have to com I have to commend Jeanette for her absolute amazing recall. Now I know this is probably half ghost written, half edited, and everything else, but her recall for the things that went down in these moments in her life was absolutely incredible. Like, and it, it shows because she said one of the, one, of the, one of her biggest talents in this industry was being able to read lines and memorize them instantly, or like just be recall. I couldn't, I could never be an actor because I'd be like line, line, no, no, line again. No, you said it once, line again, line again. 
I, I just, I read, I read an ad at the beginning of this video and I have to read that thing 15 times before I say it to your face. I'm so bad at it. So it's actually, I, I find it so impressive and it's really weird. I find people that have good memories really impressive because I have, like, I love my wife's memory, incredible memory. I have, it's gone. And so I don't even hold on to grudges and things. I'm maybe she does. <laughs> she remembers everything I possibly did wrong. I don't remember anything that went wrong. So I just, it's kind of good to live in this kind of rose colored world, I suppose forgetful glasses it, it's nice when she starts when she's six years old and the industry is super super competitive already and this mom is trying to put her in commercials you 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 go get you go get managers and things like that and the mom is literally dragging this girl along everywhere she goes let's continue Deborah, their mother daughter bond deeply disordered and chaotic she says her family struggled financially over time like so many other child stars her acting paid the bills it felt like a lot of pressure and then I think my mom saw my career as a way out of that life, of that way of living, of that constant grind. How can um, in the book, Jeanette goes on to say things like, you know, they were always her mom was always on the phone with, you know, the, the phone and the electricity and trying to get things, ex, you know, uh, extended because they kept running out of money. The dad had a job, um, the grandpa had a job, and they all kind of lived together in this little weird world that their mom was a hoarder, like a incredible hoarder. Like the kids didn't even get to sleep in their bedrooms. They had to sleep on these Walmart. She kept saying Walmart pads. Like, I'm sorry, these Costco bed pads in the living room altogether. If you actually think about it for a second, it's like the craziest thing. Their house is just full of everything and the kids all sleep in one little room together. It's unhealthy, first of all, but it's, it's really weird. And then when she starts making money, they start, it, she doesn't really actually say how anything really changes after the money starts rolling in actually. Chaotic was that childhood home. You describe it with one line that stuck with me that the air in the house felt like a held breath. It was really complicated. My mom also had cancer when I was two years old. That was the first time she was diagnosed. So not only was it chaotic because of the abuse that was happening um, and my mom's violent and erratic, unstable behavior, but also because we all lived in fear of her cancer coming back. It's interesting she says that because her mom, you, it's really, really weird because you know what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to look at Jeanette McCurdy's story and her, her mom's story, and I'm trying to understand it from the perspective of family vloggers because that's kind of my expertise now. I consider myself an expert on family vloggers, exactly everything they do, and they all follow this kind of same pattern. But it's really interesting because everybody had to walk on eggshells around Jeanette's mom, and at every opportunity that mom would use her cancer diagnosis and recovery to like get things she would she would tell it to, to security guards to try to get past certain checkpoints oh, i helped this mom with cancer i had stage four cancer and she would use it all the time it's narcissistic right she uses and the same thing happens in this family vlogger world where these like let's take i keep using just family because it's just an easy one where she always continues to flaunt what you know, it, it, it seems like she's flexing, but it's also like, oh, woe is me type of world. I had three baby daddies. I had three, two divorces and all this kind of stuff. And it's like the negative aspect of that, but they're trying to sell, yo, yay me, but use it as content, use it to push themselves forward. And it's exactly what Jeanette McCurdy's mom did, would use it against her children. Right? She would she would hold that cancer and, oh, it might come back and it'll be your fault if it does. It's the most heartbreaking thing you've ever heard. That volatile relationship is at the center of Jeanette's dark and deeply personal memoir. I'm glad my mom died. What made you pick that? I think I earned that title through the writing of the book, but I wanted it to be something that would grab people's attention and get them to pick up the book and then hopefully learn by the end of it. Here's my take on I'm glad my mom died. And she doesn't even say it actually throughout the entire book. I was hoping the last line would be I'm glad my mom died. She didn't. I mean, maybe that's just me being cheesy, but she didn't say it. But yeah, I think what, she, what what's happening here is Jeanette didn't actually realize even until years after her mom died about how wrong everything really was. And I've said this a lot about my abuse and a lot of key people who come from trauma and abusive situations from their childhood. That's your normal. That was Jeanette McCurdy's normal. She didn't know anything better. And so she didn't realize till afterwards that holy shit, this was wrong. Jeanette McCurdy's mom also abused her in many ways too, essayed as well. She would give her vaginal exams until she was, I think, 16 years old. She would shower with her because she had to do her hair properly. Her mom was just, I don't know if it was like a predator. It is predatory, but I'm not saying it wasn't like, 
I don't know because she doesn't really dive deep into the the why her mom did it. It just feels like a control thing rather than a sex thing. Does that make sense? And both are incredibly terrible, obviously. Um, and it really just goes to show that the control that these parents have over their children in the grooming and everything else is really, really, really powerful when you can shield them and control them and hide them from everything else, which is a, lo a lot of these family vloggers do. A lot of these family vloggers will take their kids out of school so they can keep them home for content and they want to shield them from everything else. Right. Again, I know I'm comparing the two because that's kind of the world I live in. Why I have chosen that title? From the tender age of 11, she says her mother taught her the dangerous habit of calorie restriction, which would turn into years of eating disorders. Yeah, and she says at one point in the book that she was at 98 pounds or 89 pounds or something like that. It got even worse after she was free from her mom. And you can see it here, right? Eating disorders are a real thing. And so we got to talk about that a little bit here because all of these people, like child actors, like family vloggers, they live in the public eye, right? The optics matter. What they look like matters. That's why a lot of them get lip fillers, get face fillers. They get tummy tucks, breast lifts, breast implants, butt lifts, and everything. Like a lot of these mommy vloggers and some of the daddy vloggers, they get, they get their hair done and all that kind of stuff. And the kids, they live in that world. And a lot of people come at me and really, really hate that I talk about that stuff. They think that it's misogynistic to talk about these these fake things that these parents like, like crazy pieces in the teeth and everything else. Like a lot of these moms specifically, because, you know, let's face it, women are the ones who mostly get these types of surgeries. OK, um, but they literally fakeify themselves completely because there's a camera. Right. And nobody ever really talks about the ramifications that will have on the children. Now, I had a video lined up about Bonnie Holine talking about all the surgeries and the butt lifts and everything else she's gotten and the ramifications it's going to have on her daughter and the body dysmorphia and the eating disorders and everything else this could push on the children. Because what, the, what you see when your parents do things, right, you will mirror that generally. So if you're wondering, hey, mom, why are you getting butt lifts and boob jobs and lip fit implants and all this kind of stuff, when your daughter sees that, she thinks that what that means is that she needs to do that in order to be important, in order to be valuable. Now, if you're, again, I always go back to informed consent and I always go back to consent, consenting adults. If that's what makes you happy, go for it, right? But don't ever pretend for a minute it doesn't affect your children, especially if you have daughters. If your whole world is just about what you look like, then your daughter's whole world is just about what she's going to look like. And so it's really important to build these things in our children to know that you are amazing and valuable how you are and maybe have the conversation with the kids, but all these mommy vloggers, and I can't even name one that hasn't got at least something done with their bodies. What that does is it pushes that and those expectations on their children. And a lot of them, and I've had people admit this, will calorie count with their children. They want their kids to be skinny. They want their kids to be good looking and they will dye their hair. They will Photoshop them and everything else. And those kids live in that world that Jeanette did and their parents flaunt it like it's a lifestyle. That's really scary and something we rarely ever talk about, if ever. And so don't ever forget the fact that when you see all these yummy mummies and all these people getting surgeries and all that kind of stuff, what it's going to do to the children. Have we ever discussed that anyway in the world? Have we ever discussed it with a psychologist? If, if your parents are completely look one way and then a few years later, they look completely different. How does that affect you? Look at Hollywood moms who have younger kids who grow up in Hollywood with them. The kids tend to do the exact same thing because the standard is set. Like, I'm pretty sure the Kardashian children are all going to do the same thing. The Kardashians are a perfect example of this because Kim got all the surgeries. And then the younger sister, who looked completely different, that was the example set. That was the necessity that they had to do in order to follow in the footsteps. In many ways, your mother tried to keep you a child. Yeah, I think my mom wanted to keep me as controllable uh, as possible. I think she really wanted to have her influence on me. And me growing up was a threat to that. The key to that was calorie restriction. Absolutely. I think my mom encouraged and conditioned my anorexia because both she thought that it would in some ways help my career and also because it served her goal of keeping me young mm -hmm. and under her influence. Yeah. And so in the book, she talks really about just um, not wanting to grow breasts and everything else because she, her character on Nickelodeon and all these people, again, it's not just the mom here. Yes, it is. Of course, the mom, her mom taught her how to calorie count. Her mom literally taught her how to have, the, how to like 
be anorexic, okay? It's craziness. Her mom encouraged it and showed her how because her mom was doing it. But it has to be said, though, why do that? Because Nickelodeon and Disney and all these kids shows and everything have a standard. If you look at all the shows, there's like this uniformed look, uniform way of speaking, uniform energy, and all that kind of stuff that they are looking for. And if you don't follow that and hit that perfectly, you don't get the role. Right? It's very competitive because someone else will come along and do it, kid who already has eating disorders. It's almost impossible. It's almost, it is the exception. It's the rule, not the exception for young women in Hollywood to have eating disorders. Because once you see them out of the that world, a lot of these women just look normal. Like I was watching a documentary with Shania Twain with my wife yesterday. It's really interesting, actually. She's like in her 50s, I think, like that. Gorgeous still. But she lived in a world where she had to have eating disorders and everything else to look that way. But when she got out of it, it was just like it was not a necessity anymore. The book reveals dark episodes of her childhood that for years, Jeanette says she blocked out. She describes how her mother would give her showers and touch her invasively until she was a teenager. She referred to them as medical exams on your private parts. Yes. This was the hardest part of the book for me to write about. It was a really emotional experience. I laughed during the writing of it and then I cried a lot after I after I wrote that vignette. You talk about basically having out of body associations, out of body experiences when this is happening to you. Yeah. What do you think was going on? I've tried to understand and that didn't lead me anywhere productive. I would just spin my wheels trying to understand my mom's motives. This continued until you were 17? Yeah. And you describe in the book that you felt violated. Yes. Yeah, of course she was violated. Yeah, I mean, this is... Again, I, I go back to that idea. Like, I just... It boggles the mind that it was more about control and that the, it actually opens up my eyes to... Sometimes it's really not about anything but control for some people. Hey, so I, it's just a heartbreaking part of that story. And you can even hear, and sometimes she's re, cause she reads the book herself for the Audible, and she breaks down. It's very rare you hear an author evoke emotion in, in an Audible book, right? But it was really, I had to stop what I was doing and just sit there. I, it was so heartbreaking. From a kid who's been essayed, listening to other people and their traumas, sometimes the triggering is overwhelming, but sometimes you're just like, I, I feel you. You know what I mean? A lot of us people who, and you, you listen to me, who did come from trauma, childhood abuse, and all that kinds of things, sometimes listening to it is just like, hey, knowing you're not alone is kind of is kind of reassuring. But at the same time, it's sometimes things like the Daddy 5 stuff and all that can get really triggering when you don't want to listen to it. But um, at, at this point, it wasn't me being triggered. It was just like, yeah, I get it. I absolutely felt violated. And eventually accepting that was the most, I think, integral piece to my own healing and recovery. At the height of her stardom, she landed a spin-off series, Sam and Cat, starring alongside future pop star Ariana Grande. She writes about... She doesn't like Ariana Grande. <laughs> and I actually liked Ariana Grande. I knew for a fact, like, anybody like Ariana Grande who has that immense amount of talent is a diva. Like, she's a Mariah Carey diva. You know she's probably not a nice person in real life. But it actually just went to show that not only was Ariana Grande kind of a douche, but and it didn't come up from the same nothing as you know Jeanette McCurdy, but was just like all about herself and only about herself. And Jeanette did note on it, but at the same time, Ariana Grande too is 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 a victim of this world. Tensions on the set. Oh, say what you said. Say it again one more time. I said I'm really smart. <laughs> you literally wrote. I frequently made the mistake of comparing my career to Ariana's yeah. and being jealous of everything, jealous of her childhood, jealous of a music career that you didn't even want. <laughs> sure. Oh, it's funny. Jeanette has like a country. She's, she talks about it in the book. Like, it's just like, it, it's the dream of so many people. I was a musician. I would have loved to have been signed by a record label and done all that stuff. And, you know, I was a little older, so it was, it was a big deal. It was, a, it was a, you know, it consented by me to do that. And I love the world. She was just forced into the world because it's what you do as a child star, right? It's what you do. They have these set paths. If you become a Nickelodeon star or a Disney star, there's a set path. What you do next music career movies, maybe, but a lot of them, and it's really just the women because you, the, the men kind of tend to disappear into oblivion. 
But the women end up being like, oh, I'm a badass now. And then they, they become normal hu- adult humans and swear a little bit. Maybe they, 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 they're they okay to expose their sexuality and all that stuff. And they get like berated for it. And they're like, well, I'm adult. But you're not an adult because you, you're a child in most people's eyes. And so that's kind of the path that a lot of them lead. And they, it's almost par for the course. You have to have a music career. You have to have this and do this in order to get to the next step. You have to like do that thing that makes you look a little bit not childish anymore. That's what they do. And they're all corrupted, every single one of them. It's just gross. The industry is nasty. I was jealous of simply that she played charades with Tom Hanks. That's what got me. She raised with Tom Hanks. How dare she? I know. <laughs> but I was so young at the time, and I think it's really hard to not compare yourself to somebody at that age when you're in an environment around them all the time. Um, so I made that mistake repeatedly, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm glad to be at a place now where I wouldn't trade positions with somebody. As the show was airing, her mother died of cancer. Jeanette says her life was spinning out of control, anorexia morphing into bulimia and alcohol abuse. I was never aiming for bulimia. I was attempting to have anorexia, but I couldn't keep it up without my mom. So then that would lead to... She has a couple of stories in the book where her mom was sick in the hospital. This this one stuck out, stuck out to me because um, she became bulimic um, because she... Once her mom wasn't around anymore, she got to move out on her own. She was on tour. She started eating and started enjoying food. And like, again, this is why you don't shelter your kids from everything. This is just one example of why it's dangerous because she gets out on her own and all of a sudden she's eating like crazy, gaining weight and everything else. She feels bad about it, but she loves the food. And then her, she goes to see her mom in the hospital. Her mom's like, you know, cancer is written and her, all her mom just comments on her. She's like, what happened to you? Right. This is like the most heartbreaking thing I've ever heard. Like they're both, her mom is bedridden with cancer. And I know what it looks like. My mom died of cancer. When I saw my mom for the last time, it was like she was a different person, right? She looked like she's 150 years old, but commenting on her weight because the, her mom couldn't control her anymore. And that's what spun her into binge eating and then purging, right? And that became her life. And it probably still is. And it's just, just crazy. The amount of, the amount of danger there is in sheltering and controlling your kids to to every minuscule amount. I'd starve myself for so long and then I'd binge and then I'd purge because I I hated the feeling of fullness. Hated it. It would take Jeanette years to seek proper help and start therapy to begin grappling with her trauma. I couldn't initially accept the idea that my mother was abusive toward me because my whole way of life, my whole way of mm-hmm. going through the world was I was operating through this lens of my mom wants what's best for me. Even after she died, I'm nothing without my mom. I can't do anything without my mom. I'm incapable. I'm incompetent. What would mom want? What would mom think? What does mom need? That accepting that she was abusive would have meant reframing my entire life. Again, it's the only thing you know. It's normal. Humans are so adaptable. Good and bad. Because kids who grow up in abusive situations like the Daddy 5 situation recovering, these kids don't know any better. Right? They don't know the other side. When they get a taste of the other side, it's like, oh my God. That's why sometimes it's such a hard thing to say, but it's like almost better for these kids to be out of these situations. It really is. And the government and the crown and the states and everybody else who who, who deal with kids in foster cares and adoption situations, they often always take the side of the parents instead of the children. When we know, in most cases, it would be better for those kids to be out of that situation. But they'll they'll shoot for reunification every single time. Doesn't matter how bad it was. That's crazy. The fostering and adoption system is broken. And I think it's broken beyond repair. And that felt impossible. I couldn't go near that for a long time. Jeanette says that building a new life without her mom began with a stunning decision to leave acting behind. Why quit acting? It was important for my recovery at the time. It represented my mom living vicariously through me. It represented something that my mom wanted that I didn't want. So it was important for me to step away in a very definitive way and really just focus on completely on healing myself. Yeah, she says in the book too that she um, <laughs> she just got on a call with her manager. She's like, well, 
I'm done, everybody. And they're like, okay, well, let us know if you want to do some more. And that was, that was it. The industry's so cold. It's so cold. Reflecting back on her career, Jeanette's critical of the Hollywood machine she, and the world she was exposed to at such a young age. You see these pictures of her at these awards ceremonies, thumbs up and everybody. And she hated being recognized. Hey, Sam. And she hated all that kind of stuff. And to this day, if someone says, hey, Sam, she won't acknowledge them. But if she say, hey, Jeanette, she'll still acknowledge fans. Only if you acknowledge her as who she is. Right. But knowing what you know about the book and then seeing these videos of her, she hated every effing second of it. In her book, she writes that after Sam and Cat was canceled, Nickelodeon offered her a $300,000 thank you gift if she agreed to never speak publicly about her experience at the network. And that's a big deal. Specifically with a man she refers to as the creator. The creator is Schneider. Dan Schneider, I think his name is. And yeah, that guy's a predator. 100%. And he just allowed unchecked to do what he wants to do to kids and treat them the way he treated them. In her book, he is a monster. But it's like almost like a Harvey Weinstein type of thing, right? She doesn't go into explicit detail about anything really crazy. But hear me out. This guy here is a kid's creator? Why? The people that live in kids' creation worlds, the adults, are weird. They're weird. Okay, like Tiffany. And again, it crosses over into like the Piper Raquel situation, Tiffany Raquel. And you get all these parents who are part of these kids in these squads and these YouTube worlds. And all they do is hang out with teenagers. They're not right in the head. An adult who only spends time around kids is not right in the head. There's something wrong, right? Because they don't get adult interaction anywhere. Who on one occasion, she says, encouraged her to drink while she was still underage yep. and gave her a shoulder massage. In response, Nickelodeon telling ABC News, we have no reportable response other than a no comment at this time. Typical Nickelodeon, you assholes. I just said, no, it's not happening. That sounds like hush money to me. Not yep. doing it. Not she turned down $300,000 because she's like, I want to tell my story. That is hard because she's, again, she made a little bit of money. You know, she's not poor or anything like that, but she was like that. She says in the book, that was a really, really, really enticing offer and that I could have used. She turned it down because it was more important for her to tell her story. That's amazing because she could help other, and this is the best part about this, is that because she could tell her story, she could possibly help future kids who might be targets of this guy. Taking it. And then I do remember leaning against, I think I talk about this in the book, but I lean against my bed and I'm like, well, shoot. That could put up for my nieces through college. Like, that was some good money. But I am ultimately proud of, of my decision there, um, wherever it came from. Even if it was informed by self-righteousness, I think that, uh, I think I did something that was really hard to do. Oh my God, it makes it emotional. I'm proud of myself. Mm -hmm. She should be. Why? Why proud of yourself? I think I've chosen... a path of integrity. I agree. And she even says in the book, and it really struck me, she's like, like, I'm not stupid enough to think that this is all not self-loathing. Because a lot of people might take that book, like people who Ariana Grande, if she can read, probably might read that book. Or the people in her world might say, well, she's just complaining. What are, you know, People are like, oh, woe is me, you made millions of dollars being a child star. And she's like, she was just so self-aware that what it might sound like. But I didn't see that for one second. All I saw was this, this girl who was forced into a world she didn't want to be in and exploited the whole time she was there. Just like kids in family vlogs. And it hasn't always been easy. Now 30, Jeanette says she's recovered from years of eating disorders and found a sense of balance for the first time in her life. What's your body image now and what's your relationship to food like and how do you sort of go about your day? I'm glad you asked this because when people talk about eating disorder recovery, they talk about it being such an ongoing process and something you deal with every single day for the rest of your life, and it's always a battle. And I think that kind of language, it doesn't help motivate. I'm at a place now where I don't obsess about food at all. I haven't engaged in any sort of disordered eating um, behavior for years. I'm really proud of that. Good for you, Jeanette. Good for you. Um, Jeanette says healing also comes through in her writing. She's working on a novel and a collection of essays. And while she sees herself as a writer, she hasn't completely ruled out a return to acting. I just wish I could have shown my 20 year old self me now. I would have known what I was aiming for. I would have had something to hope for, something to be encouraged about. I didn't have that. What would you have told your 20 year old self? Look at me now, baby. <laughs> 
<laughs> You're gonna be fine, kid. I probably would have said. I, you know, it's it's important. Again, I want to reiterate the idea of these kids who are working full time in this industry, right? You got these child actors who are working way more than they should. They don't have a normal childhood. They don't have normal friends. They don't have normal upbringing. They don't get to do normal things. They're always working. And the thing is, is that they're they're working because they're putting their they're paying for their family to live. Right. And she not only lived in an abusive situation, but that's kind of the same thing that's happening on the family vlog world where they but they'll say this type of thing like you only see 15 seconds of her life or you only see 10 minutes or 20 minute vlog of her life. But these kids live in that world, too. These parents are creating that content and often it's forced and faked. And it's like, oh, we're going to go do this thing. We're going to go apple picking. And the kids are like, okay, great. It's going to be a vlog of apple picking. It's not going to be us being a family going apple picking. It's not just us being a family going on vacation to Disney because the camera's got to be on all the time. And you have to be someone you're not when the camera's on. These kids are forced actors in these parents' worlds where they make money. It's really crazy. And so Jeanette McCurdy's mom who forced her into this world is very similar to what these parents are doing to their kids on family vlogs. And she gets the right to say, I'm glad my mom died. Because honestly, her mom dying was the best thing that ever happened to Jeanette McCurdy. It really was. She was freed from all that bondage that her mom had her under. Okay? She was, she, I don't think she's a Mormon anymore, but she was like hardcore Mormon for a very long time. And they just used it as a, I don't know, as a prayer thing. It was really, really weird situation. I'm glad she escaped the religious side of everything because that was just, you know, on top of the sheltering and everything that was going on with her mom, she also had the Mormon culture, which is like doubling down on that shit. She didn't experience real life until real, until later. And it was really sad. And I'm scared that that's what's going to happen with these kids and family vlogs. They're not going to actually experience real life until they get out of this craziness that their life is. They are, for all intents and purposes, abused, just like Jeanette McCurdy was abused. They are forced to do something they don't want to do. Jeanette McCurdy said, I think she was seven, maybe it was 11, I forget the age. She told her mom, I don't want to do this anymore. And her mom freaked, and so she changed into, oh, I was just kidding, right? These kids, if they ever tell their mom they don't want to do this anymore, are their parents really going to stop? And what about those kids that can't tell their parents, I don't want to do this anymore? Right? We're seeing so many Reddit threads and all these of these kids popping up who won't tell you what families they were in. You're saying, I hated every second of that. Right? What about the kids like my night's toddlers who can't say shit? What about kids who can't make informed decisions because they can't even speak? What about fathering autism with Abby, who, who will never be able to speak or give her in consent? And she, what, 17 now? What about all these kids who can't say what they want? What about them? And all these parents are like, what's well, my decision? Because my kid, I do what I want. And it's true. These moms are like, these, these kids are my property and I will do what I want with these kids. And to a degree, they're right. You get to make decisions for your kids. What they're going to eat, what time they go to bed, what activities they might be doing. You let them obviously have choices and you help them along with those things as they get older and things. But you do. You make the choices for your kids. But these parents are making the wrong choices for their kids. And that's why we talk about it. They're making the wrong choice. And by exploiting these kids like Jeanette's mom did for monetary gain, you become the villain. You become someone who has lost all moral capacity. You do not get to stand on anything else except for the fact that you now are an abusive parent who exploits their child for cash. Exactly what happened in Jeanette McCurdy's case. So... Just an amazing book. Please do yourself a favor. Get it on Audible or, or buy it. Go to the library. Do what you got to do. Read the book. It's an incredible, incredible story. Well written. Just she's an incredibly gifted person. Um, Jeanette McCurdy, if you're listening to this, I'm sad for your child, but I'm glad that you get to escape that. Some people don't get to. And so thank you for writing that and being a voice for you know the future of kids are coming up in this world, even though I don't think much is going to change. And I think you can probably agree with me. It's probably just as bad or worse now. Oh, parents who use their kids for cash. What a f crazy world we live in. Just selfishly crazy. Everybody take a deep breath. <sighs> wow. Sometimes, you know, when you talk about a certain subject for so long and then you get one of these kids who come out for that and they talk about it, you're almost like you feel vindicated that you're kind of right, but you wish you weren't. Right? You know I'm right. I know I'm right about it. I know. And then when I'm vindicated, I'm like, yeah, I know. But you're like, why do I have to be right? Why can't we be all wrong about this? But we're not. 
It's such a scary world that these parents put these kids in. Just a bunch of dicks. But you guys are amazing. And I want to thank you for being here and being amazing and incredible and valuable. Don't you forget it. You look amazing in those pants. And I'll see you tomorrow.